And I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears toward their pride. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is the word of God. Let's bow together and pray before we begin. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises that we can stand on and rest upon. Remind us that as we uh, venture each day, Lord, in times which are so troubling we see around us, we pray that we would rest solely upon it. We thank you for giving us this place to meet. We thank you for giving us health, that we're able to be here and that our bodies work and that we can worship you together. We ask that our time together would bring you glory, that we would please you in our worship and our study of your word together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I first became a Christian, I was in a church that every Sunday service, the first six years of my life going to church, we would sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, every single Sunday. And so I spent about 300 Sundays in a row singing this song. So it's very near and dear to my heart. If I ever get dementia, this will be the last thing to go for me. <laughs> Let's sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name together.
desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against evildoers. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Our text today from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 to 12 is a quote that Peter takes from Psalm 34 which Tim read at the beginning. If you have your Bibles open, I'd like to turn to Psalm 34 so we can see the context uh, of that psalm and why Peter decided to quote that at this time in his epistle, Psalm 34. Um, perhaps in some of your Bibles, as you look there, at the heading of Psalm 34, it says this, A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. So David was writing this psalm at a very difficult time in his own life while he was fleeing from his enemies. And he was so concerned about his own life that he pretended to be crazy in front of his enemy so that his enemy wouldn't take him seriously and just cast him out. And that's when he wrote this, Psalm 34. I want to first read uh, verse 1. In this incredibly difficult time in David's life, he writes this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. What a remarkable thing for David to write in the midst of a situation where he himself felt so desperate that he needed to act like a crazy person just to get away from his enemies. And if you skip down to verse 12, David writes this, Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Peter takes that, just that section in Psalm 34, and he paraphrases it. Now, since he's the inspired author of Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he's allowed to paraphrase what the Old Testament is saying, okay? Because he's trying to emphasize something very in particular, um, and we're going to see what that is. So Peter takes this piece of Psalm 34, which he then applies to the circumstances of those to whom he is writing in the first century. He's been telling Christians how to bear up under difficult circumstances all the way until now. And in our text, Peter tells them, in essence, that if they desire to be content, 
No matter what the circumstances are in the world surrounding them, they need to follow this particular instruction. The world encourages deceit, and it encourages evil, and it encourages retribution as the means to get what one wants. Deceit, evil, and retribution appeal to the natural man. Now, you might think, really? Deceit, evil, and retribution appeal to the natural man? Yes. I mean, there is a reason, and I don't want to be a hypocrite here because I've watched some of these movies myself, but there is a reason that the gangster genre of film is so popular, okay? You have films like The Godfather and films like Casino and these that came out, right, that became multi-multi-million dollar films, and, and what's the, the whole theme of them is deceit and evil and retribution. And so these things appeal to our flesh. But we're going to see the antithesis of them in our text today as God's way toward true life and good days. Don't you want to see good days? Don't you want to have a sense of joy and love even now in this world and not just pie in the sky by and by when we die. And of course, that's not what true faith in the kingdom of heaven and in the Lord who gives us the kingdom of heaven is about. It's not pie in the sky, but still, I think that there is a sense in which sometimes Christians can just be so overwhelmed by the wretchedness of this world that it seems very difficult to find any joy in this world. And we just want to be taken out of it. We're ready to go. I felt that, especially recently. I felt that. Ready to go, Lord. Just take me out of here. Stop the roller coaster. I want to get off. And that's the reason why Solomon says in Ecclesiastes that we should seek the Lord and find joy in Him in our youth before the evil days come and we say, I have no joy in them, right? Yeah. And so this word here that Peter's going to tell us today, I mean, especially when so much of the church in America, at least right now, is very concerned about what the next four years is going to bring for us, and we can see evil days on the horizon. Um, Peter says, if we wish to love life and see good days, we must obey his command. So let's ask the Lord now, one more time, to be with us now and to really believe what Peter is saying. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and love you. We thank you to, for bringing us to this moment today. It is your will that we have been alive and you have sustained us and brought us here and we thank you for that and if we have been overwhelmed by the evil of this world I do pray Lord that you would give us joy in the middle of trouble and help us to see your hand in all things and help us to rejoice in the great manifold multitudinous blessings that you've given to all of us in this room Help us to have hearts of thankfulness and to turn away from all manner of unrighteousness and wickedness and deceit and malice and to speak the truth in love and to seek peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Many other translations, NIV, KJV, uh, um, ESV, say in verse 10 something to the effect of whoever would love life and see good days. The NASB, which is the one I'm preaching from, says whoever desires life to love and to see good days. This is an interesting phraseology, isn't it? Jesus says in John 12, 25, 
He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And so what then does Peter mean here? Is he contradicting his master and preaching a Joel Osteen type of message now? If you wish to see good days, if you want to live your best life now, you need to do these things. <laughs> no, God forbid. Okay, God forbid. Um, remember that we need to take each text within its proper context. In chapter 4 of this epistle, in verse 12, if you want to turn there, chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter writes this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. See what he's saying there? It's not strange for us to go through fiery ordeals. That is what is going to happen to all of us in this world. Fiery ordeals. You just think about that. I'm not trying to steal my thunder for when I get to that part portion of Scripture. By the time we get there, you'll forget that I said any of this. But isn't it enough when we go through regular ordeals? <laughs> right? I hate going through ordeals, don't you? But Peter says... Not only will we go through fiery ordeals, but it's not even going to be strange when we go through fiery ordeals. Because they're so common. Fiery ones. Burning ordeals. Ordeals that truly hurt. So it almost seems like if you wish to, see, to love and see good days, do these things. But friends, you're going to have fiery ordeals. And don't be surprised when those things come. See, Peter is under no illusion that this life is going to be easy, especially for the followers of Jesus. And therefore, what he is teaching us here in this text is how to maintain joy in the midst of suffering. How to, in a sense, love life despite the fact that we suffer and go through fiery ordeals in this world. And in essence, what he's going to teach us is that we do so by living with a clear conscience in obedience to Christ during these evil days. That's it. That's the lesson. That's going to be the lesson for us today. That we will love and see good days when we live in obedience to Christ, no matter what the outward circumstances of our culture or the world throw at us. We will still be able to say, man... Today was good. In the hardest trials of our lives, we might still be able to say, today was good. Today was good. God always works for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. He always works for our good. Therefore, if He always works for our good, then every day of our lives is for our good. And it is coming to that realization that Peter is going to help us here to do in our text. It would be so easy for us to lose our joy in Christ if we take our eyes off of Him and look at our circumstances. Of course, Peter, of all people, understood this perhaps the most because it was Peter whom Jesus said, come to me on the water. And as soon as Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and looked around at his surroundings, at the blowing wind and the rising waves, when he saw all of that stuff, he started to immediately sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me! And Jesus still saved him. But it was when he took his eyes off of Christ and looked instead away from Christ and at the world that the world started to overwhelm him. You see, he was still in the actual water when that happened. He was there. But while he had his eyes on Christ, everything was well. Right? Think about it. In those moments, in those moments, as 
The disciples and Peter see what they think at first to be a ghost walking on the water. And Jesus says, be not afraid, it is I. And Peter says to him, if it is really you, Lord, call me to you. And Jesus calls him. In the midst of this storm and the wind and the waves, Peter gets out of the boat and he steps on the water and he walks on water. In that moment when he did that, as his eyes are on Christ, he's walking toward Christ. Do you think he could say in that moment, today is a good day? <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> right? I don't know the physics of all of that, how Jesus performed that miracle, but I know this, even in the midst of that incredibly otherwise dangerous situation, while Peter had his eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, all was well. And he could actually say, I mean, the text doesn't record this, but I can bet Peter's thinking as he's like stepping on water and walking toward Jesus. This is amazing. I love this. Today is a good day. Until he takes his eyes off of Christ. Then, he says, Lord, I'm drowning. Save me. We can be miserable Christians. There's lots of those. Miserable Christians who lament every moment of this wretched and broken world. Miserable Christians who spend all their time lamenting Joe Biden and being angry about him. And, and why does he, in the first day, he signed all of these things which are antichrist. What do you expect? What do you expect? It's not that I'm not grieved about some of those things. I'm grieved about them. But I'm not surprised. We can allow those outward situations to just overwhelm us, make us miserable. Oh, what a wretched country now this is turning into. And everything is ruined. Oh. And if we feel like that, our eyes are on the wrong thing. We're looking at the president instead of looking at Jesus. There are lots of miserable Christians. Or we can be joyful Christians who love the grace of God, who love the new life to which he has called us, a life of honesty and a life of goodness and a life of peace. And those are the three ingredients, as it were, to which Peter exhorts us to honesty and goodness and peace. I'd like to look at each one briefly and then see the ultimate reason why they are so crucial toward the believer's happiness in this world. The first thing Peter says in verse 10 is, The one who desires life, to love and to see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. That's the first thing he says. The first thing. Why? Why is this the very first step in seeing good days? To keep one's tongue from speaking, uh, to, to keep from speaking deceit and, and speaking evil. Why is that? Because an evil tongue, which spoke deceit, is the very cause of every bad day that has ever happened in the history of the world. What happened when an evil tongue, which spoke deceit, went up to a woman in the garden and said to her that God was holding something back from her? It was deceitful speech which said, you shall not surely die. And that led to every bad thing which has ever happened in the history of the entire world. Uh, John 8.44, Jesus says, 
when he, that is Satan, lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The father of lies. It was a lie that caused the fallenness of this world. And the badness of this world. And the badness of the things which happen in our days in this world. And so then it makes sense that if you would desire to see good days, you would refrain from doing the same thing that Satan did. Refrain from speaking deceit and lies. Oh, how Christians must be people of the truth. Because we are Christ's people. And he is the personification of the truth. If we have been deceptive, we must repent and tell the truth, even when it's hard. Even when it really hurts. Even when it seems like speaking the truth will land us in hot water or will make us unpopular. Peter tells us here that speaking the truth is the first step in leading a life of peace and joy. Speaking the truth is. Yeah. And I think that that is an element which has become less and less over the years, particularly in the church. The element of speaking the truth. Not just in terms of like church cover-ups, of which those are manifold, and those happen a lot, but even in terms of just preaching the truth from the pulpit. It's just missing. It's missing from the vast majority of Christian churches, especially in the West today. It's just missing. Because even those who are appointed to places which are supposed to be the places of leadership in Christ's church, where they lead God's people into truth and preach the truth to them in love, of course, but where they speak the truth to the Lord's people, the truth about sin and the truth about righteousness, the truth about repentance, the truth about hell, the truth about faith in Christ and the necessity of it, the truth about Christ being the only way. The truth about the desperate condition of their people's souls. Instead of that, they want to water down the truth and speak a man-centered message. Which is basically just a message of... Isn't, it, isn't that ironic, actually? Didn't even think about it until right now. So much of the church today preaches a message about bettering one's life at the expense of truth. Right? At the expense of truth. But Peter tells us that the only way for you to see good days and love life is if you are a people of the truth. And therefore, the, the self-help messages of so much of Christendom today actually don't help anyone at all. It's absolutely worthless. You could get the same thing from Tony Robbins that you get, you know, who's a new age guy, self-help guru, that you get from the vast majority of pulpits today. We must be people of the truth. And not, not just even pulpits today, Churches in general today, the people in the pews need to be people of the truth. And the only way for us to know the truth is to know the one who is the truth, Christ, and to know his word and to listen to it and obey it and to speak it. Peter tells us here that speaking the truth is the first step in leading a life of peace and joy. And sometimes 
It seems hard to tell the truth, but it is much harder in the long run if we lie, because eventually the truth always comes out anyway. Your sin will find you out. That's what the scripture tells us. So, since that's the case, we might as well get our things on the table now. It's much easier that way. Look at verse 11. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. The one who desires life to love and see good days must turn away from evil and do good. That word turn away is the word uh, ekalinato, which means to fully avoid by deliberate, decisive rejection. To fully avoid, to turn away from evil. In other words, we must repent. We must fully avoid and decisively reject evil in whatever various form it takes in our lives and turn to good. Now look, I know that all of us wrestle with the flesh and its desires. And it is a struggle which we will continue to fight with for the rest of our earthly lives because in our earthly lives we cannot escape our flesh. But fight we must. Not only for the primary reason of obedience to Christ, which is indeed the primary reason, but also because if we choose to sin, we choose to suffer. Sin and evil are not without consequences, both in this life and in the life to come. And I know that self-denial is hard. But the consequence of living a life of unrestrained evil is harder. It is harder. Our time in this world is but a vapor. And though the world makes it appear as though the good life consists of debauchery and orgies and drunkenness and revelry and licentiousness and all manner of disobedience to God, that is not the good life. Listen, for those of you who, specifically I'm talking to now, but to those of you who did not live life as a believer until you came into, say, your 20s, Would you now, if you know Christ now, would you choose to go back to the life that, that you lived formerly? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not once you taste the goodness of Christ. Not once you taste the, the, the joy of salvation. Of freedom in Jesus. Of the new and regenerate life. Like, you don't want to go back to that. Even though we struggle sometimes and we make choices that are like, wow, is my old man still alive right now? I can't believe I just did that thing. And Lord, forgive me. Like a dog going back to its vomit. Sometimes those things happen where we, we slip and fall, make mistakes and sin. But I don't know one single Christian who would ever trade their new life, their regenerate life, for the life that they used to live as the living dead. I don't know even one. Not even one. I was recently talking with someone who could not understand, they just could not understand why a person would ever wait to have sex until marriage. They could not fathom such a decision. They even laughed when I said that that is the way that God intends for it to be. They said that's ridiculous. But I can tell you, that this person's life is full of trouble because of their choices to the contrary. Do you know what celibate people, for instance, don't have to worry about? STDs, unwed pregnancies, relational instability, not to mention the wrath of God against the sexually immoral. Like, yeah. Instead, if we wish to live and see good days, we must turn from evil and do good. See, Peter doesn't say, turn from evil and do nothing. He puts it in the negative first. Turn away from evil. And then he puts it in the positive. Turn away from evil and do good. This is an active imperative verb. 
Not only are we to refrain from something, but we are to engage in something else. And that is actively serving the Lord. We are to engage in feeding our brother. We are to engage in taking care of the sick. We are to engage in preaching the good news to the lost. And by engaging in those things for Christ's sake, Peter says, we will love and see good days. Don't some of you know this experience? Oh, those of you who serve in the food bank at the old church, don't you know this experience? That when these people are coming hungry and you're giving them the love of Christ, when you do that, when you see them, they're lining up at the church to receive some physical food and you're serving them and helping them shop for free food and you're also sharing the gospel with them. When you leave there, how do you feel when you leave there? Do you feel like, gosh, that was a waste of time? Never. Never. You feel like this was a good day. This was a good day. Praise the Lord. All glory to Him. Nothing from me. It's all of Him. Absolutely. This is a good day. No matter what's happening in the world, this is a good day. When Matt and Magda Almy go to the nursing home to minister to the elderly, when you, when you do that, and the nursing home, I, I, know, I know what they smell like. I know what it's like. Do you leave there? When you go there, do you leave there? And after you're done, do you say like, gosh, what a waste of time. Man, the place is stinking and gross and nasty. And like, there's all these old people. Like, are you like that? Never. Never. Let me ask you honestly. Do you feel love and joy in your hearts? Literally every time. Yes. I knew your answer would be yes, without even telling you beforehand that I was going to say this in my sermon. I knew it. Because if you want to love and see good days, then you must turn from evil and do good. And when you do those things, the things which God commands of you to do, i.e. make disciples of all nations, even those in the nursing home, when you go and do that, it's like you leave there walking on the clouds. I know that you do because when you meet on Thursdays, you give reports about the conversions or the beautiful things that have happened in the Bible study. That the joy of doing that carries over day to day. It actually carries over. It's not just some light thing that's like gone, gone away. No, you think about them. You pray for them. You love them. You want to serve them. Like you're turning from evil, doing good for Christ's sake. And you love them. And you see good days. You see good days. It's beautiful. I mean, I can tell you this. Like, When I'm finished preaching here every Sunday, I always feel like, praise the Lord. I'm so glad for this, these brothers and sisters who meet together. They want to know Christ and they want to hear the Bible preached. And it's so beautiful. What a privilege. Every Sunday for me is a good day. It's a good day. Mm. Amen. Turn from evil and do good. Third, the one who desires life to love and seek good days must seek peace and pursue it. Christ is the Prince of Peace. Therefore, those who belong to Him and were purchased by His shed blood on the cross do not have the option to live in enmity with their brothers or sisters. In as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Romans 12, 18. You know who wrote that, right? Who wrote Romans chapter 12, or the whole book of Romans? Paul did. That's Paul. 
who at one time in his life was the main persecutor of God's people in the first century. Paul, who was traveling to Damascus to throw Christians into jail and eventually stone them. He was changed by the grace of God and he realized the evil of his actions. And so what happened? In his repentance, he turned from evil and he did good. And what else? He pursued peace. He pursued peace. That man was at one time devoid of peace. He was devoid of it. He had no peace in his life. He was full of fury. But then the Lord changed his heart, gave him love and joy so that Paul could even later be in prison for preaching the gospel. Which is such an unjust reason to be in prison. So unjust. The old man Saul of Tarsus, if someone had thrown him into prison for doing something which was just, all right, I guarantee that man would do nothing but yell and scream and fight and kick and do anything he could to get out of there. But this new man, Paul, the man whom Christ has saved by his death on the cross and his resurrection, this new man, Paul, says to the church at Philippi, Rejoice! And again, I say, rejoice! Rejoice! And it's not that he liked his chains. He didn't want to be in chains. It's not that he somehow looked at his outward situation and he's like, yeah, this is so great. I love having burn marks on my wrists from chains being on them. He, is, in fact, says to Festus and, and Herod, I wish that you were as I am except for these chains. I don't like these, this situation. I don't like me, David. I don't like the situation that's going on in our country. All right? But despite all of that, despite all of that, Paul says, I rejoice. I've learned the key to satisfaction and joy in any circumstance. Because he had the peace of Christ in his soul. Seeking peace is hard. To hold a grudge and nurse the root of bitterness in one's soul comes naturally to sinners. But living without peace is harder. It's harder. Living without peace is the cause of ulcers and sleeplessness and anxiety and worrying about one's what one's enemies uh, might do, but how sweet it is to pursue peace and forgiveness. Now, there is a sense in which we cannot always control whether or not someone doesn't like us or wants to harm us. That actually comes with the territory of being a Christian. We can't necessarily control that. But in as far as it depends upon us, we must be at peace with all men. Not at the expense of truth. That doesn't mean we sacrifice truth on the altar of peace. But it does mean that when we speak the truth, we tell the people to whom we are speaking truth, I care about you, I love you, and that's why I'm speaking the truth to you. And we don't do it in a way which is angry and mean and divisive and hurtful. We don't do it in a way which puts others down. We don't do it in a way which sprouts bitterness. And when we speak the truth in love, and when we love people the way that Christ wants us to love people, in truth, by hating what is evil and clinging on to what is good, being sincere, Romans chapter 12, um, Sometimes that will mean that people are going to hate us for it. They're going to hate us for it. And that's okay. And we can still have peace in our hearts and with God even when that happens. Because we know, uh, you know what? The reason this person is angry is not because of me. Actually, they're really not angry with me. Because I wasn't being disagreeable. They're angry with God. And that's between them and God. And perhaps 
with Christians also, there are times in which we have legitimate beefs with people. Legitimate. Serious problems that go on. And when that happens, and we feel like we're the ones who have some bitterness inside, we need to pursue peace. We need to reach out. We need to not wait for the other person to say sorry. We need to follow Matthew 18. Go and show your brother his sin. Why does Jesus tell us to go and show our brother his sin? Why doesn't he just tell us, swallow it? Right? Just swallow the pain and the hurt and the anger. Just swallow it and be a stoic. Well, because stoicism is not Christianity, first of all. Okay? I think sometimes people mistake those two things and think that by being stoic, you're being somehow spiritual. And that's not necessarily the case. He wants us to go and show our brother his fault if someone hurts us or sins against us. He wants us to show him his fault so that there can actually be peace. And so that there's not a root inside of bitterness that grows up inside of us. Because if we just swallow it and say, I'm just going to forget about it, it's not actually gone. It's still there. It's still there. And so we are to pursue peace. And sometimes pursuing peace means there's going to be some hashing out that has to be done. That might be a part of pursuing peace. In order to have peace, some things need to be hashed out and talked out. And it might not be pleasant, but it has to happen. And then once it does, then you can sleep soundly and without worry. Look, these three elements that Peter mentions are all three, all things which Christ himself did, and he calls us to do them. Keep our tongues from evil and our lips from speaking deceit. To turn away from evil and do good. To seek peace and to pursue it. And then in verse 12, we see the primary reason why. Look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. What a wonderful thing it is to know that the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. This is it. The Lord sees. He sees us. His eyes are on us. Malachi 3.14 tells us that some people say it is vain to serve God. But then in Malachi 3.16, the text says, The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. A book of remembrance was written before the Lord. The Lord has a book. He doesn't need a book. All right? He knows all things. He doesn't need a book. But he has a book anyway. And it's God's book of remembrance. And he remembers the things that we do in his name for him. He remembers them. The Lord remembers them. Just think about that for a second. The Lord, his eyes are on the righteous. He remembers what we do for him. God watches what we do. His ears are attentive to your prayer. God remembers how you live for Him. God knows your work. In Revelation, He says to the church, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Revelation 2.2. 2. I know your tribulation and your poverty. Revelation 2.9. I know where you live, says the Lord. Revelation 2.13. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. Revelation 2, 19. Look at that. Our Lord is not like the deaf and dumb and blind idols of the Asherahs and the Baals and all of that. No, the Lord knows us. He sees us. He remembers us. He has a book of remembrance. Do you remember in the book of Esther? 
And the king was up late, Nebuchadnezzar was up late one night, and he asks, Bring me the king's book of remembrance, the record of deeds, the things that were written down. And then he sees, he remembers what Mordecai did for him in saving him from his enemies who were trying to kill the king. And he says, what was done for Mordecai? How was this man honored? And his attendants say, well, he wasn't. And then the king said, ah, I'm going to honor this man. I'm going to raise him up from his lowly estate. Because the king remembered. Because he had a book of remembrance. And that's exactly what he did. Our king knows and cares, and his eye is toward those who do what Peter has commanded. And not only is his eye toward us, but his ear is inclined toward our prayer as well. His ear is. So many people think that God listens to everyone's prayer no matter what. But the scriptures are clear that there are things that we can do which hinder our prayers to God. Look at verse 7 of chapter 3. You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. So your prayers will not be hindered. What? That must mean that prayers can be hindered. That's a scary thought, right? That a husband, say, for instance, there's other places in the scripture uh, that talk about ways in which your prayer can be hindered. But just in this case, in verse 7, that a husband who treats his wife badly, that is actually hindering his prayer to God. That's kind of a scary thing, honestly. God does not listen to everyone's prayer equally. He does not. Peter tells us, his ears attend to their prayer. The, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. Let me ask you this, just rhetorically. When you hear that the eyes of the Lord are on you, how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel that the ears of the Lord hear you? How does it make you feel? What is your instant gut response to that? I listened to a man once named Christopher Hitchens, who sadly died with no evidence of faith in Christ at all. He wrote a book called God is Not Great. He was an atheist. Um, of course, no one is truly an atheist, but he suppressed the truth in unrighteousness and called himself an atheist. And Hitchens once said in an interview, the thought of an infinite being who sees everything that I do is absolutely repulsive to me. Absolutely repulsive. Who would ever want to believe in a God who sees everything that they do. Well, right, Christopher Hitchens, right. Because you're wicked. That's the reason why. That's the reason why, like, he let the cat out of the bag there. Like, why? Why wouldn't you want God to see you? I don't want him to see me. Why? Well, Jesus gives us the answer why. In John chapter 3. Because the wicked hate the light and will not come into the light. Why? For fear that their deeds will be exposed. That's the reason why. But those who do what is right come into the light. That's what Jesus is telling to Nicodemus. You, you come into the light. The light of God. See, and of course, even the darkness is light to God. We fool ourselves, deceive ourselves into thinking that God doesn't see us. Okay? And so lights are off. Like, no, he sees. He sees. Because even the darkness is light to God. He sees everything. And when, in the beginning of verse 12, it says that his eye is on the righteous, 
It's not talking about an eye of condemnation. This is reminding Christians who are righteous not because of our own deeds, but because of what Christ has done for us. We are righteous not because I live a great life, but because I am in Christ and He is in me. That's why I'm righteous, right? That the Lord's eye is on the righteous is a reminder that Peter is giving to us that God is going to remember what we do for Him. He's going to remember it. And not only that, but He's going to even give us reward for it, which I know, like, even that, there's something inside of me that almost grates against that idea. Like, it almost grates against the idea of, like, Lord, I'm worthy! I don't need anything else. Like, don't give me some reward. The reward is just knowing you. I don't need any other reward, Lord. Except for the fact that Peter himself says, right in our text, that we are going to get a reward to sum up all, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, or insult for insult, but giving blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So it's not wrong for us to, because Peter says we are called that we would inherit a blessing, for us to say, Lord, even though we don't deserve it, thank you for this. Thank you. This is simply evidence of his overwhelming, overflowing, above and beyond grace to us. That we would inherit blessing more than what we already have? How? How is it possible? My cup is so full, it overflows. He has given me everything I ever need. Inherit what blessing? Like, on top of everything else, heaven? Man. It's marvelous. It's amazing. This is just a reminder from Peter. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. He sees and he knows and he remembers. And his ears attend to their prayer. Oh, thank God for that, too. His ears attend to the prayer of the righteous. He hears us. He knows us. He knows what we want before we even ask for it. He knows our desire for his sake, the salvation of our loved ones. He knows all of it. And he's inclined toward us, unworthy sinners who trust in Christ and who bear the fruit of the Spirit. But the verse does not end there. It says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. second half of verse 12 is terrifying. It's terrifying. I cannot comprehend, much less describe, the terror of that statement adequately. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. How the frown of God should call us to tremble in fear. Oh, friends, our prayer should be that the Lord's face would never be set against me, that he would never look on me as the object of his wrath and fury. Just this alone should be enough to cause the strongest men to be overwhelmed with fear. But amazingly, so many live in utter disregard of the fact that the face of Almighty God is set against them. They live in disregard of that. It doesn't even matter to them at all. That they are just one breath away from an eternity in hell is something which doesn't bother the vast, vast majority of people in the world today. How is it even possible? I think that the shock and awe of the day of judgment is going is going to be so great for so many 
who lived their lives without a thought or inclination whatsoever to the fear of God, that when they see him face to face and his face is set against them, even that phrase, his face is set against them in anger and fury, the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, set against sinners, it will be indescribable for them. It will be hopeless then, in that point. Truly, utterly hopeless. And they will regret, not with true biblical regenerative repentance, but they will regret every single sin of their entire life. Jonathan Edwards says, wishing, wishing against all hope that they had just committed one less sin in their life than what they actually committed. Just for one less sin, they would give anything and everything. Because God is the infinite God, and He is the infinitely holy and righteous God. And we must pray, God, impress upon the lost their desperate condition. Give them a true and holy fear of God. Enable your people to live in obedience to you by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And may the Lord enable us, friends, to love and to see good days, days of fruitfulness and joy, days of witnessing the remarkable work of God's Spirit. Because when, when we witness that, like, that's what it really comes down to. When we speak the truth in love, when we turn away from evil and pursue good and pursue righteousness, like, when we do these things, when our hearts are filled with the peace of God, then we become unflappable. <clears throat> then Christians become unflappable people. People who, you know, actually are, are so unflappable that the world really, really starts to hate them and persecute them even more. Right? It was this fact this fact that Peter's talking about here, that when Christians like love and see good days by doing these things that actually ended up in so many of them losing their lives in this world. It resulted in them losing their lives because when the emissaries of Caesar would come into their town, and say, you know, when the banner of Caesar, when you see it, you must get on your knees and you must say, Caesar is king of kings and lord of lords. You must say that and bow down and worship the image. And those who believed in Christ said, no, no, I will not do that. Because I can't betray Christ no matter what. And they were willing to lay down their lives and be crucified or have their heads cut off for the sake of Christ because they were unflappable. Nothing could move them. Nothing. Not even the threat of nails through their hands and feet. Not even the threat of a sword. Nothing could move them. They are the heroes of old. And there are still heroes now today too. I still think about those 19 men who were brought on the beach by ISIS in North Africa. And they were given the opportunity to deny their faith and save their lives. But they were unwilling to do so. Why? Because to them, to live was Christ and to die is gain. That's the reason why. And 
even when a wicked demon, oppressed, demon-possessed, satanic cult leader has a knife to their throat and is telling them, I'm going to saw your head right off your body. Even when that happened, they said, today is a good day to see Jesus. I will love and see good days. <clears throat> All the days of my life, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Whether here or in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And they died. They died in faith. They are heroes. They are just as much heroes as, you know, Latimer and Ridley burned at the stake. Just the same. They had the same faith. They had the same peace going to their deaths. They had the same. It was the same. And that same Holy Spirit who lived in them can live in us. Let's ask the Lord now. Well, I should say this. The same Holy Spirit, if you know Christ, does live in us. Not can. He does. Let's ask the Lord now to help us live and see good days no matter what the society does or what happens in the world by living according to the way Christ wants us to live. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these practical exhortations that your servant Peter has given to us. Thank you that we can see the maturity in Peter's life and the de development of his understanding of you from the time of the Gospels to the time of his first epistle. It's almost like a different person that, that we are reading. It's like a different person is writing. And the reason why, Lord, is because we know you grew him up you grew him up in the faith. And you filled him with your spirit. I'm so grateful for that, man. And so grateful for this letter of First Peter. And I pray that you apply it to us now, what we've been learning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' name again. Uh, the wrong hymn got, got printed <laughs> on the back. We'll just, we'll just sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' name twice. It'll be the 302nd time that we that I sang it. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll, sing, we'll sing that together. Let's sing. And grow. 